uh, mostly about linear perspective, the idea that um, we can take the way that the projected size of objects change as a way of computing properties of visual space. And last time I gave you um, several different models of how you might do that, and I argued that uh, the visual system actually has to use several different models depending on the context that it finds itself. Today, I want to, uh, we're not going to talk about size change anymore. I'm going to talk about line drawings. Now, I should warn you in advance, I, I try very hard uh, to sheet, especially since there are a number of undergrads in here, to, uh, in fact, mostly undergrads in here, uh, I try to shield you from uh, math as much as possible. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't do that today. Uh, we will have to go through some math, and even those who've had math probably don't have the math that we're going to talk about today. Um, I will try to walk you through it uh, so that you can understand it. A lot of this is intuitive, but I need to introduce some formalisms to um, talk about the topic today. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have had calculus at some time in your life? Uh, everybody. Oh, excellent. That means I have to do less hand-holding than I had feared. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about line drawings. Uh, this is a famous example of one uh, from a cave painting in France, like 30,000 years old. Um, here are some other examples. Uh, this is from Pablo Picasso, 1920, a portrait of uh, Igor Stravinsky. Now, this is a particularly interesting one because um, uh, here we have a photograph of uh, Stravinsky, and here we have the line drawing by Picasso. And uh, you can, can you all see the likeness there? Now, remember, when we talked about Picasso doing weird stuff, I mentioned that, you know, he was perfectly good at doing pictorial representational art, and it shows up really clearly in his drawings. Not so much in his paintings, but in his drawings. And this is a good example of that. Now, the problem that we're going to worry about today, uh, you've never thought about, there's not a big literature on this, um, and most of the literature there is is in computer vision, not in uh, uh, human vision. But the question we want to ask is, how does the artist know where to draw the contours? That's the question. And we're going to try to answer. So here are some early examples. This is a, a patent. Um, here's a painting by Flaxman in 1805. Again, you can do wonderful things with line drawings. Um, this is one of my favorites by Matisse from 1932. Again, Matisse was also famous for doing, uh, trying to distort his paintings as much as possible, but he's not doing that in his drawings. This is one that was made by one of my students who was an uh, uh, architect and designer. He actually did his PhD thesis on the problem that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is a statue in front of the, um, actually I'm not sure where it's in front of, it's either the um, art Museum in Columbus or the library. Um, anybody know which? You don't hang out in the Art Museum or the library. Um, but anyway, this is a line drawing of that. Uh, this is a Henry Moore sculpture. And this is a line drawing that my student made of that. And again, you can see the resemblance uh, really nicely. Uh, and again, I ask the question, how do you know where to draw the lines? That's what we're going to worry about today. Here's another Matisse, Lulu in a flowered hat. Uh, this is a lot more minimalist than um, uh, some of the early ones I show, but you definitely get the impression of a, a young woman in a hat with just a few lines. Here's one of my favorites here. Um, what do you see here? A figure from the back. Is it? Um, a male or a female? Female. female. Um, actually, one of my students last year gave me a t-shirt with uh, this drawing on it. My wife refuses to let me wear it, though. <laughs> uh, so it's pristine clean. But, 
Uh, now notice he's getting, you, you sort of get this distinct impression of a female form, and he's got what, one, two, three, four lines there. Pretty amazing how much you can reduce the structure and still capture what it is that's trying, that he's trying to depict. That's probably one of Picasso's favorite objects. He was famous for that. All right, so the first thing I want to do today is talk about uh, different ways that contours can arise in images. We're going to see this is going to be an important theme throughout the course. And the reason for that is that we have different models of how you compute various aspects of visual information. It turns out that almost all of them work on some types of contours, but not on other types of contours. So the first thing I want to do today is just talk about the different kinds of contours that can exist. And uh, we'll come back to this over and over again when we start doing other models of things like stereo and motion, things like that, of what the underlying assumptions is about what contours are dealing with. So if we take texture, well, I'll come back to that in a second. So here are the different kinds of contours. They're reflectance contours. Reflectance contours would be like the design on her backpack um, or the Dylan on his t-shirt back there, right? So part of his shirt is black. Uh, it absorbs most of the light. Part of the shirt is white, which reflects most of the light. And there are contours formed at the junction between the black regions and the white regions. So those are called reflectance contours. They arise where you get a, a difference in the amount of reflection from one location to another. Illumination contours, and there are two types, shadows and uh, spotlights. Uh, this contour right here is an illumination contour, right? You have the projectors projecting light on the screen uh, and it's confined to this square region. So the reason you see a contour here is because this region is getting much more illumination than that region. Uh, and that makes this a reflectance scar. Another example, uh, see if I can see anything that's visible to you all. Um, how about right up here? Can you see this contour right there and right here? All right, that's a shadow. We see those all the time. That's another example of a illumination contour. We have corners, and corners can be of two types, concave and convex. So what a corner is, is a, an abrupt change in surface orientation. So if we look, for example, at this corner of the room right here, right, we have um, one part of the wall that's facing this way, and this part of the wall that's facing towards you and there's a rapid change in the orientation from this to this along that boundary. And that's referred to as a, um, a concave corner. Uh, similarly, convex corner would be um, this contour right here at the edge of the table. All right, so this is convex and you see the contour. This is also a reflectance contour because uh, the top of the surface is, doesn't have the same color as the side. Uh, so these different categories are not mutually exclusive. You can be two different kinds of contours at the same time. Occlusions, they also are of two types. Uh, there's what's called a smooth occlusion. So a good example of that is if you look at me right now, you see my arm, and there's part of the arm where you see my arm, and then right above the contour here, you see the background. This is called a smooth occlusion because it, um, the surface is varying smoothly where that contour is occurring, as opposed to what's called a corner occlusion. And a good example of that would be this contour right here on the back side of the table. And then finally, we have what are called specular highlights and reflections. Um, 
I don't really see any here. Somebody have something shiny? What's that? All right, yeah, you see shiny regions on the floor? Thank you, that's a, that's a good example. Now the problem is I could point to this, but it's not gonna work because everybody sees the highlight in a different spot. All right, so I see it as right here. You probably don't see it there. Now, where do you see it? Over here? <coughs> Highlights change with the viewing position. And um, reflections do the same thing. So we'll talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, a, a like shiny watch. Well, watch. my watch. Yeah. There are highlights on here. Okay. Um, but again, they they tend to hang on corners, so um, regions of high curvature. But they don't necessarily have to be in corners, so you can see them on the floor. Um, but they change with the viewing position. We'll talk much more about highlights when we get into the shading part of the course. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's still look at some examples of this. So here we have a very simple figure. There's a cylinder uh, sitting on top of a ground plane. Uh, so this would be a reflectance contour. We have blue tiles and gray tiles. And the transition, so this contour is defined because this region and that region reflect light differently. One's blue, one's gray. This would be a convex corner right here. So it's an abrupt change in surface orientation and it's convex. This would be a concave corner down here. You have an abrupt change in surface orientation, but it's concave. Here we have a corner occlusion right there. Here we have a smooth occlusion here. Here we have a shadow right there and a specular highlight right there. All right, so these are the different kinds of contour. These are the ways that uh, images can be generated where you get sharp transitions from one intensity to a different intensity. And the key thing I want you to keep in mind here is that can arise for many different reasons. What we'll see a little bit later in the course is that artists will, when they're making line drawings, will use uh, mostly corners and occlusions and they'll almost never draw specular highlights or, or shadows. And we'll see some examples of that later. If they do, uh, they have to add some kind of coloring in, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later. All right, so now we're going to get to the math part of this course. Uh, and I'll, um, as I say, I'll try to make it as gentle as I possibly can. Uh, has anybody here had a course in differential geometry? Not a hand, not even our engineering students. Okay, good. So you're all on a level playing field. Uh, that's what I'm going to try and explain to you today. It's pretty ugly if you get into the actual algebra of it, but it's not really ugly at all conceptually. Well, I'm going to stick to the conceptual level as much as I can. Okay, what is this thing right here? It's a teapot. And let's suppose you were trying to represent this teapot. How might you do it? Uh, no, not by drawing one, by say you're writing a computer program and you want a database that represents the structure of that thing. Well, how, would, how might you do it? Any guesses? Yeah. Points in an XYZ plane. Points in an XYZ plane. So the idea here is if I take any point on this object, it has a set of coordinates, XYZ, right? So X is position this way, Y is position this way, Z is position this way. Um, and so let's say you're looking at it and this thing is 
um, so many visual degrees to the right and uh, so, some distance and depth and uh, so many degrees up and down. And so each point, you would have a triple of numbers uh, that defines the position of one point on there. And so one way of representing uh, an object like this is you just have a set of those coordinates that's sometimes referred to as a depth map. It's probably the most popular data structure in computer vision. Um, it's also probably the most, most worthless data structure in human vision. We'll talk about why that is. Um, all right, so everybody got the idea of this depth map, right? So for every point on this thing, I can represent what the x, y, z coordinates are for every point. So if I now have a whole array of those points, as you see here, right? So every cell here will have a set of coordinates, and that's what defines the shape of the surface. Now, that particular kind of representation has a name. It's called uh, a Monge surface representation. And that's named after a French mathematician, a guy by the name of Gaspard Monge, uh, who was one of the founders of differential geometry. And what he argued is that you can represent surfaces uh, using, or at least the visible portion of surfaces, uh, using this form. So z is a function of x and y. So let's go back to this drawing. Let's go back to this one. All right. So x and y are the coordinates in the image plane. And there's some function that relates every x and y has a z, which is the z coordinate. And so if you can express the surface in this form, where uh, you have some function that says for any x, y, there is an associated z with that value of x and y. All right, so this is what's called a mange surface. And um, it's, it's a very convenient representation. By the way, it turns out, I may talk about this when we do shading, that visual images have the same mathematical form. So for every point in an image, x and y, you have some intensity that's associated with it. Right? Same form. The image, x and y, now instead of putting z's here, we're putting intensity values. So it's bright here, dark there. You do exactly the same thing, and mathematically, if you're describing that, um, you do it using this form right here. Now, my colleague Jan Kunderink has done has several interesting papers where he shows that this is, if you represent images this way and surfaces this way, you can discover invariants that map one to the other, but I won't get into that. All right, so now, let's say, can I borrow your notebook a second? All right, so let's say we have this mall surface representation. And you're going to represent this right here. What would go in all those cells? So let's say this point is two feet away from you. How far is that point? Two feet. How far is this point? Two. Right, so if I travel over the surface, um, there's no change. All the z values are the same. Now, if you've all had calculus, what does that mean if I now differentiate z as a function of horizontal position, what would that derivative be? Yes. The reason it's zero is because z is not changing. All right, so what the first derivative does, it measures how rapidly is z changing with x. In this case, it's not changing at all, so the derivative is zero. Suppose I did this. Now, as I move across the surface, it's closer to you here than it is there. 
what would the derivative of that be? Would it be zero? Um, it would be something different from zero. Depending on how you set up your coordinate system, it could be positive or it could be negative. Uh, that, that's sort of an arbitrary distinction. All right, so uh, what calculus is doing, it's providing a way of describing how depth varies as a function of position. That's the first derivative. We'll get to the second derivative in a second. Thank you. Um, so the idea here, uh, this is a table. Uh, probably you can ignore some of this stuff, but the main thing I want you to get is if you look at this representation right here, so notice I have z as a function of x and y, and then now look at this notation right here. I have um, orientation, you have f with a subscript x and f with a subscript y. What this means is this is a derivative in the x direction and this is a derivative in the y direction. All right, so if I go back to your notebook again, um, here dx dz, I'm sorry, dz dx would be, um, would be positive, but dy dx would be zero. If I do it this way, dy dx is positive, I'm sorry, dz dx would be dz dy would be positive and dz dx would be zero. Uh, you're getting the idea here? So what the, what the derivative is doing, this representation is what's referred to in computer vision as gradient space. And it's a very, uh, if you want to represent the local orientation, you can do this at every point. So if we go back to this thing, right, and I can say, well, how is the how is the surface changing right here? Well, it's changing rapidly in this direction and less rapidly in that direction. All right, so not only can you have a depth map uh, that you associate with every point on the surface, you can also represent the surface orientation at every point on the surface. Now, there are a couple of ways of representing orientation, uh, and they amount to a change in coordinate system. So in this case, we're breaking the coordinates up in terms of horizontal and vertical, uh, a Cartesian coordinate system. But we can also do a polar coordinate system, and that gives you something like this. So if we go around this way, that's referred to as slant, and if we go out this way, this is referred, I'm sorry, if we go around this way, that's referred to as tilt. And if we go from the center to the edge, that's referred to as slant. This is probably more like how the visual system represents local orientation. Um, now, let me introduce one more thing. We can also do the second derivative. Um, that's the notation here. And there are a number of co um, uh, coordinate systems from looking at this. I'm gonna hold off a little bit, um, but one of the arguments I'm gonna make today is that um, curvature is really important for uh, where you place lines, uh, especially at these corner things, right? So corners are at places where there's really high curvature and that's where you want to draw, one of the places where you want to draw a line. Okay then, let's introduce some other scary math to you. How many have used uh, vectors before? Raise your hand. I'm seeing less uniformity here, but uh, again, I will walk you through this. So let's say that um, I'm an observer right here, and I'm looking at a point on this surface, and I can define a vector uh, on the surface that points to the point of observation. And I can also define a vector, this is called n, which is just perpendicular to the surface. This is really important uh, concept in differential geometry. So. Um, uh, if you're looking at my tip of my nose, uh, 
where would the vector be that's perpendicular to the tip of my nose? What direction would it point? Um, just straight out, yeah. Straight ahead? Yeah, straight to me. How about this point right here? Where would it point? Off to the side. How about this point here? It would point down. All right, so we're going to define two notions. Yeah? So sorry, does that relate to the, um, the experiment you discussed a few classes ago with the circles and you asked people to place them on the surface pointing out normal to the surface? And uh, that's an excellent observation. That's exactly what we're doing. So in that particular case, what the observers are adjusting in this space right here, um, oh, actually, I take it back. They're adjusting in gradient space. Um, but uh, yeah, these are just like those little things. And it turns out that um, all orientations you can map onto a sphere. It's sometimes referred to as a Gaussian sphere. Uh, it's a way of representing orientations. Um, and so there's, um, there are two vectors we want to worry about here. One is pointing to the eye, and one is normal to the surface. And we'll define the angle between them as alpha. All right, now here's the key insight I want you to get. What happens? when alpha is 90 degrees. So where on my face for you is alpha 90 degrees? Anybody want to venture a guess? All right, so it's not here. here, here. Alpha is zero here. It's not there. Alpha is like 45 degrees. And alpha gets bigger. And alpha gets bigger. And then you get to the occlusion boundary. So the occlusion boundary is the last point that you see, right? That's defined by where that angle alpha is 90 degrees. So what happens is, is that the angle pointing to the surf, from the eye to the surface is perpendicular to the angle that's normal to the surface. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, so I guess anything that's greater than 90 degrees is included, but 90 degrees is where the occlusion line occurs. 90 degrees where the occlusion line. So let's go back and look at our Gaussian sphere here. You notice how these things are getting more and more compressed? So if you get right to the boundary of the sphere, they'll point straight outwards. You won't, right, the, the sphere will turn, the, the circle will turn into a straight line. And that's at the occlusion boundary. Yeah? Would it also be like right here? Um, Is that well, depending where I'm viewing, uh, yeah, there is, for me, when I look at your nose, there is an occlusion at the bottom of the nose. I can't see the whole bottom. So you can have internal occlusion boundaries. It's not just what separates my body. Uh, so for example, if I hold my arm like this, there's an occlusion contour on my arm. Um, and then there's also an occlusion contour on my torso. So that would be 90 degrees as well? That would be 90 degrees. So all occlusion contours have an alpha of 90 degrees. Now remember, alpha is the angle between the vector that points toward your eye and the vector that's normal to the surface. Now you might think, let's say you're a little kid and you want to draw mommy. What do you do? You want to draw a head. What do you do? I need a volunteer. Come up here, draw me a head. Um, Do a profile head. A profile head. Profile head. Okay. From what what kind of profile? Like a three like quarter. That. that? Okay. Yeah. Ninety degree profile. Ninety degree profile. All right. Drawing skills on pure display here. Wow. That's uh, all right. not, bad. not bad. I don't think we have a budding Picasso here, but you did just what I wanted. All right. What are the alpha values for those points? that you drew. 
90 degrees. 90 degrees. What he drew was the occlusion boundary. So when you're doing a drawing, the occlusion boundaries are uh, one of the first things you're going to draw. So occlusion boundaries are really important for drawing. Now, some artists will play tricks. They'll leave them out, but they'll have um, illusory boundaries, right? They'll imply the occlusion boundaries there. But you, you're going to want, uh, so a good example of that would be, where's that Matisse? Uh, so he's got one on the hat, but the face is, but he puts the chin there. You can't go without any boundaries at all. So he's, he's given you enough to get it, but he's not giving you the whole boundary. All right, now, back to your question. You can also have internal boundaries. So let's look at this object right here. Um, here. Why don't you point to all the occlusions in there? Okay. Um, so we got that's all occluding a little bit right there. Uh, certainly all the way around the outline. Uh, looks like that one's an occlusion, probably. Um, probably not anything on the bottom. All right, very good. Now, I want to make another distinction about occluding boundaries. So uh, there's a thing, a term you're all familiar with. What's a silhouette? It's just the outline of a shape. It's the outline of a shape. So the silhouette, everything on the silhouette is an occlusion boundaries. But it's not all the occlusion boundaries. So there's some on the inside. Right? So the silhouette would be this shape right here. It doesn't exactly give you the best depiction of this object. It still looks pretty flat. If we include all the occlusions, not just the outer boundary, uh, this is what's called the rim. So this has the internal ones as well. And this gives you a much better depiction of this shape than that does. Now you can do cool things with silhouettes. I mean, you know, there's lots of art that takes advantage of silhouettes. Uh, but if you're trying to depict a line drawing, you want the whole rim, not just the, not just the outer contour. You want the inner contour. Now, it turns out you can improve the line drawing. Well, let me, let me back up one second. So the idea here, at every point along these black contours, the angle alpha is 90 degrees. And so the cosine of that angle is um, a minimum. In fact, it's, it's zero. But let's see if we can improve things a bit. So suppose now that we say, I don't want to just draw contours where alpha is 90 degrees. I mean, you get some information from that, but maybe I can extend it and get line drawings that look a bit better. And the way, this is a group at uh, Rutgers University, uh, DiCarlo, has suggested that um, we may also want to draw a contour if that alpha is a local minimum. And somebody tell me what a local minimum is. Give me a go. When the derivative like, stops changing or reaches a maximum or a minimum value. Well, you can have a local minimum without necessarily doing derivatives. So what this case would mean, if you have alpha is, is a scalar. Um, so a local minimum would be a spot where alpha is lower than any of its neighboring points. That's what's called a local minimum. And so what uh, DiCarlo suggested was we'll get a better depiction of surfaces if we not only draw the occlusions, 
but we also draw what he referred to as suggestive contours. All right, so these are points where alpha is not equal to 90 degrees, but uh, cosine alpha is a local minimum. And let's look at some examples of that. So here we have a uh, bust of, I think this is Apollo, using just the smooth occlusion contours. And you sort of get the bust of Apollo. This is what happens if you throw in the suggested contours. How many of you think this is a better line drawing than that? Everybody agree? All right, so what are we doing here? What we're trying to figure out is where on the surface I want to put a marking <coughs> in order to get the best line drawing that I possibly can. Now, there are a couple of issues here. If you're in uh, computer vision and you do this, you might have an internal representation of the surface. You calculate these things. Uh, if you're an artist, though, if I'm looking at you, you know, do I know the... Yeah, I can recognize the occlusion contours, but do I know when alpha is a local, uh, cos alpha is a local uh, minimum? Probably not, but yet the artists are able to do that. So what the, um, what DiCarlo is trying to figure out is uh, where do you draw it to get the best looking uh, contour drawing that you possibly have? This is actually a very active field in computer graphics. Uh, there's a thing, uh, I don't know if any of you have dealt with this, called tune renderers. So basically what they do is they don't render shaded images like most renderers do, but they try to create line drawings. Um, and there are a lot of applications where people would like to do this. And so what people in computer vision, uh, some people in computer vision, try to figure out if I have a, an actual bust of Apollo, um, you know, how do I get the best possible drawing for that? Uh, now, to actually do this in real life, they have to scan Apollo, get a really dense depth map, do the derivatives of that to be able to calculate um, the alpha values. And then from that, they derive where these contours should go. Almost certainly not what humans are doing, but it's coming up with what humans intuitively think are the best contours. Any questions about this before I move on? All right, so we're dealing with first derivatives. Um, how quickly are the orientations changing? The, the most quick orientation changes are at the occlusion boundary. And that's gonna be the first place that we mark. Uh, and then according to DiCarlo, the other place we want to mark is where uh, the alpha values are a local maximum or coast value is a local minimum. Those are the same statements. Okay, here we have another object. These are the suggestive contours and the occlusions not a particularly good representation of this, is it? This, on the other hand, is the suggestive contours, occlusions, and corners. And so now we get something that really, so there's hardly any difference in the appearance of these two things. Now, psychologists have made a big deal about this because the idea that you can throw away so much information put it in a line drawing and get the basic structure out saying that this is getting at the essence of what we really see. Yeah? Wait, so on the left, I thought, aren't those like, mainly the smooth occlusion contours, not suggestive ones? Um, there are no smooth occlusions in this image. There are only corner occlusions. So you only, get you only get smooth occlusions for smooth objects, like my head. Right, if you have polyhedra like this, then it's a, then it's a corner occlusion. Now both of, them, both of them 
all artists would say, yeah, you include all occlusions yeah. in your drawing. Uh, the, the new feature is the suggested contours. And now I'm going to argue that we also need to include the corners. But that means now we have to define what a corner is. <coughs> so corners are discontinuities in surface orientation. So if I take this object right here, and I draw all the um, discontinuities of surface orientation, we get this line drawing, and I think you all agree that this is a good depiction of that. So how do we define a discontinuity in surface orientation? For that, we have to look at the second derivative. So where the first derivative is saying how quickly is depth changing? Let me borrow your sheet of paper a second. Oh, yeah. Yours. All right. So if you take this example here, depth's changing rapidly in this direction. It's not changing in that direction. What are the orientations doing on here? Uh, orientations just they're all the same right mm -hmm. so if I if I did a second derivative I would just get zeros because there are no changes in orientation now let's contrast that with this mm -hmm. so what is the second derivative in this case so suppose I do the second derivative this way what are you gonna get it's it's highest at the, the, the right so the orientation is changing rapidly in this direction. What if I do the second derivative vertically? It's not changing at all. So the principle is exactly the same as we did to try and get slant. Except instead of looking at the rate of which depth is changing, we're looking at the rate at which orientation is changing. So for a flat surface, the second derivative vanishes. It's zero. The second derivative kicks in when we have curvature. And it turns out that corners are places where the second derivative is at a maximum. All right, so I gave you the intuitive stuff. Now let me do a little bit of geeky stuff. Just a little. Um, anybody have an idea of how you define curvature? Have you ever, ever had a need to how one might measure curvature? How might you do it? Well, one common way of doing it, what they call the radius of curvature. <coughs> So let's take the crook of my elbow as an example. And suppose what I do is I, I stick a, a sphere in here. And what I want is the, or a circle. And what I want is a circle whose size just fits. So the boundary of the circle just fits within the crook of my arm in some local region. And so the way we measure curvature using that technique is what's called the radius of curvature. So high curvature would mean you need a really small circle to fit in there. Whereas low curvature, you could get by with a really big circle. So that's one way of measuring curvature. Um, there's another way of measuring curvature. <coughs> which is by looking at the second derivatives of the surface depth map. So let's suppose here I have a surface, and there I have a normal. Turns out there's a famous theorem which says there are two directions of principal curvature. So there's one direction where the curvature is higher than any other direction. And it turns out that 
the direction orthogonal to that, the curvature is smaller than any other direction. So the proof that those two things are orthogonal was done by uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And he was so enamored by that um, proof that he called it in Latin his theroma egregium, which is remarkable theorem. Um, now, it's remarkable for a number of ways. One is that the curvatures are perpendicular to each other, but the other is you can measure the curvature without ever having to leave the surface. That was the, the really big deal, but we don't need to get into that. Um, and so another way of describing curvature is like the curvature of these principal directions. And they're typically referred to as K1 and K2. So K1 is the direction that has the maximum curvature and K2 is the direction that has the minimum curvature. And they're always orthogonal to each other. Now there's also a thing called Gaussian curvature, which is the product of those two things. <coughs> uh, this is also quite useful. So uh, we talked a little about this in, um, when we talked about Ramanian geometry. Uh, so the uh, saddle shape has a negative, uh, K1 and K2 have opposite signs. That would be like the crook of my elbow, right? It's concave in this direction and convex in that direction. Uh, whereas opposed to my nose, is convex in both principal directions. So the Gaussian curvature of my nose would be positive, the Gaussian curvature of my elbow would be, or the crook of my elbow would be negative. So again, there are a number of coordinate systems that we can define this stuff in. And uh, here's one where we convert K min and K max, or K1 and K2, or K1 and K2, uh, to a polar coordinate system, and we end up what's called uh, the shape index. So here the shape is changing, but the magnitude of curvature is not. And if we move out radially from the center, the magnitude of curvature is changing, but the shape is not. So here's the hypothesis that I'm going to push for you. This is my, my student, Flip Phillips. Uh, and what he argued was um, that where you want to draw contours is where uh, K1 and K2 are local maxima. <coughs> so based on the curvatures. And here would be an example of this. So let's take this object right here. So this is just a rectangular brick. And what I did is I smoothed the edges. So this is not a discontinuity in orientation anymore. But where is the orientation changing most rapidly? Point to it. Uh, like so? Yeah, all along. So all right, so those are the regions. It's not a discontinuity, but the curvature is higher in those regions than it is in any other region. And so let's suppose we mark those regions where the curvature is a local maximum. And if we do that, we get something that looks like this. And would you all agree that that's a pretty good depiction of this object? Now, if we did suggested contours or just the occlusion, right, you, just, you need this internal stuff for this to look reasonable. If you don't have it, it it's not a very good depiction. So if you just have the, uh, the, the occlusion contours and the suggested contours, that, that's not going to work in this case. You need something else. And um, so the suggestion here is that what we're using is the um, local maxima of curvature. Here's some other examples. So here we have a randomly shaped object. Uh, these lines are where K1, K2 are maxima. <coughs> There's some ugly math that goes into computing this, but um, conceptually, hopefully, it works fine for you. And is this a reasonably good depiction of that? Same down here. Here's another surface. Uh, this one does have occlusions right there. <coughs> 
But if you just have the occlusion contour, you get one line here and one line here, and that's it. Oh, I guess you get this, this little bump right there. But if you add the curvature extrema, uh, then you get a line drawing that looks very much like that object. Any questions about this before I go along? All right. The point I want you to get from this is that when we make line drawings on objects, the artists are not putting those lines at random. They're marking specific surface features. Now, it's a very good question of how the hell they know where those features are. Uh, they're clearly not going in and have a representation of the depth map and doing all the derivatives they have to do. Uh, but they are marking the same places uh, that a, a computer program would mark to get, to get something like this. All right, so whatever it is we know intuitively about this complicated higher order is sometimes referred to as differential structure. So the first order differential structure is the orientations. The second order differential structure is the, um, is the curvature. And zero order differential structure is the depths themselves. Um, so one argument that's makes that curvature, you might think, well, it's impossible to compute, but it's probably an essential, essential aspect of how we uh, mentally represent objects. All right, let me end by coming back to, uh, and I'll let you out a little bit early today, because I know this lecture has been denser than most of them. Um, let's go back to our drawing about different kinds of curvature. Now, one of the things that you should note here is that what I've talked about so far, uh, where artists draw, are corners. And if we include curvature extrema, we're sort of generalizing the notion of what a corner is. Um, and occlusions. So of all these different contour types, the, um, the types of contours that we've considered so far as being good for line drawings uh, have only been two of these things. So the question is, what if we put lines on the other ones? Would that improve the quality of our line drawing? So let's take this, what do you see here? A teapot. A teapot, different from that other teapot. Uh, now if you wanted to draw this thing, where would you draw lines? Show me with the pointer. So you draw the boundary, that's good. And you draw that um, sharp corners right there. What about that highlight and what about those shadows? Would you draw those? No. Why not? <laughs> you have a good intuition of what you should draw. So let's, let's look what happens when we add some of that stuff. So here's if I do all the lines. That's not a very good drawing, is it? We've got, uh, so the highlight is here, just look in the shadow. That, I mean, it's just weird, it doesn't belong there. Uh, that's what you would get, by the way, if you took this image and you just plugged it in Photoshop and said, find edges. That's what it would give you. So that's not what artists are doing. They're picking what edges they want to show you. So let's say we do what you said, and we do that. That's what you had in mind, right? Do you all agree this is a much better drawing than that? Now, we can improve upon this, but in order to do that, we have to add at least a little bit of grayscale. An example of that is shown here. So the key thing here is that shadows aren't just contours. They also have a polarity. So the shadow is always darker than the stuff around it. And highlights are always brighter than the stuff around it. And so this is done with a tune renderer. 
so you give it a model of this object and then you render it with shading. This is what you get. Um, if you do a tune rendering, you can either get this or that. Um, and so this is with an option that says add some grayscale. And so what it does is it makes the shadows darker than anything else and it makes the highlights brighter than anything else. And you need that to be able to make sense of the shadows and highlights. Now you get a similar thing if you're drawing, say, a face. So let's say you wanted to draw his face. What would you do? Would you put the face in Photoshop and say find edges? It wouldn't look very good. There are a couple things you have to fill out. So like the eyebrows. If I just do a line around the eyebrows, they don't look like eyebrows, they look weird. Right? So if you're drawing eyebrows or a beard, you don't just draw a line around the edge of his beard. You've got you to gotta fill in a little bit of color to get it to be interpreted as a beard. Um, just an outline isn't going to hack it. So let's look at some examples of that. So here we have a photograph of a person. This is from uh, Alish Martinez's database over in um, electrical engineering. Um, you can ignore this for the time being, or just ignore this entirely. Uh, here we have where we reduce it to just three gray level values. Um, here we reduce it to two, and here we just have the lines. And so notice, even with this reduced representation, you can pretty much recognize that it's the same guy. But as soon as you go to here, you can't recognize that worth a damn, right? So you need a little bit of grayscale. Um, I mean, binary image almost does it. This is a good depiction here with three levels. Two levels, not quite so good, but with just the outlines, it's terrible. All right, so the moral of the story is that if we're drawing line drawings, we have to stick to the ones that you said intuitively. That would be corners, and occlusions. Like all, draw, all artists are going to draw those. If you want to throw in shadows and um, highlights, you've got to provide at least a minimal amount of grayscale information to get that polarity. And the reason why that's important, again, is shadows are always darker than the stuff around it and highlights are always brighter. And so you need something in the image to capture that property um, like you would see here. But this is probably the best depiction of all. I believe that's it. Um, so I'll spare you more math for the next several lectures. Uh, hopefully you learned something in here that uh, you hadn't known before. Uh, but the most important thing is that you get some insight into what's special about line drawings that make them so fascinating to study. Uh, by at least some researchers in perception. So uh, have a good weekend, and um, we'll be here for the exam on Tuesday.